So uh, I titled this uh, The Collapse of Jeff Harvey's Wave Function. I don't know why, but um, maybe there's something in here. So th thanks, Jerome, for the photo. I look for a, a photo, Jeff, of uh, you and I at, uh, at Caltech, but I, I couldn't find one. This looks like your uh, Groucho Marx imitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't see the cigar. OK, so um, I'll start I'll, I started a collaboration with Jeff a little bit. So uh, I was a graduate student at University of Texas in the particle theory group. Wayne Dykus was my advisor doing, and we did a neutrino phenomenology, and we did a little neutrino cosmology. Somehow I uh, managed to get a postdoc at Caltech uh, in the <clears throat> W.K. Kellogg Radiation Laboratory. And uh, the, sort of the, the main person there was Willie Fowler, and I'll say a word about him in a minute, and other people you may know, Steve Coonan, Tommy Tombrello, et cetera. And uh, the high energy physics group was in Lauritsen, and this is where the giants of 20th century physics were all there. Feynman, Gelman, I think Pierre's gone. I had <laughs> him on this. I knew no, he would have appreciated that. So uh, I got to Caltech and uh, worked in the, um, uh, it was Willie Fowler's postdoc. And I think he hired me because uh, the year before I had collaborated with Bob Wagoner, who was a postdoc of Willie's. And uh, I was uh, familiar with a very well known paper that Wagoner, Fowler, and Hoyle had written about Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And this was about the only thing I knew in nuclear astrophysics, and Kellogg mostly did nuclear astrophysics. And uh, what I knew about this paper is it started with neutrons and protons and neutrinos, et cetera, and there was a reaction network that built up the uh, origin of uh, the elements, at least the light elements. And in this network, there were 60 some odd processes for instance, here's an example, proton plus tritium making helium four plus a photon. And, uh, you know, it was a fit to experimental data, temperature dependent, dependent upon nuclear physics uh, parameters, et cetera. And of course there was the uh, reverse reaction. So uh, this is my only thing that I knew about nuclear astrophysics. So in 1978, when I got to Caltech, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go more in cosmology, which I had started doing at the University of Texas, or to uh, go back and try to do particle physics. So I said, you know, I, I went in to see Willie the first week I was there, and the mentoring was, uh, welcome, uh, I hope you do something good. Let me know if you do, I'll see you in two or three years. So, you know, that, that was mentoring in those, in those days. <laughs> so I couldn't decide particle physics, cosmology. Uh, but about the first month I was at Caltech, there was a series of lectures by Alan Sandage. And I regarded Alan Sandage as, you know, the great cosmologist, Alan Sandage. So I said I'd go to his lectures and see what that was like. And it was, without a doubt, the worst series of lectures I had ever been to. And it was, you know, cosmology, this was well before precision cosmology. There were so many view graphs, which looked to me to have scattered points on it with no error bars and straight lines drawn through everything. And he talked about aperture corrections, long quiz by. And I went away and saying, oh my God, nobody knows anything about cosmology. Cosmology deserves the terrible reputation it had in 1978. Then uh, a couple of weeks later, there was a couple of string theory lectures. I don't remember who gave them, but let's just say it was John Schwartz. I, I, I don't know if it was John. Who else was doing string theory in 1978? Maybe Mike Green, but he wasn't there at the time. Anyway, so I went to a series on string theory lectures. And uh, after the lectures were over, I said to myself, maybe cosmology wasn't that bad. <laughs> And I have this memory, I don't know whether you were there at these lectures or doing something useful, 
But I remember uh, Murray Gelman standing up and saying, string theory is the future of physics. And I said, I'll do cosmology. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I still like uh, particle phenomenology. So I decided what I would do is to try to be a uh, superposition of cosmology and particle physics. And now that's not such a strange thing to do, but uh, there are a couple of pioneers. Mike Turner is one of them. I was one of them explorers, you know, starting this new field, Dave Schramm here. And uh, so I worked with Jeff Harvey and Jeff had the opportunity to be a particle cosmologist, but that's not the way his wave function worked out because after he finished at Caltech, he fell in with a rough crowd <laughs> in Princeton and his wave function sort of collapsed um, in string theory. And it's really a shame because Jeff could have been successful. Sorry, Jeff, the way things were. <laughs> okay, so the, the idea, at least my idea, has to do with the inner space, outer space connection. And uh, I'll read some things that I wrote that I like. A complete standard model of particle physics arising from laboratory experiments and beautiful theoretical ideas should be applicable to the universe beyond terrestrial laboratories. And in principle, allow the calculation of cosmological parameters <coughs> such as the baryon number of the universe. And a failure of today's standard model of particle physics to account completely for the observed universe, dark matter, dark energy, inflation, baryogenesis, points to the fact that today's standard model of particle physics is not the final standard model of particle physics. And cosmological considerations may point to directions for physics beyond today's standard model. And the baryon asymmetry, which is what I worked on with Jeff, is an example of this. So um, I'll talk about this paper later. I just pulled up this paper, uh, calculation of cosmological baryon asymmetry in grand unified models. And uh, it was Jeff, uh, David Reese, they were both students at Caltech and um, Stephen Wolfram, who um, well, I think was 12 years old or something like that. <laughs> so um, something, to notice about this paper that I hadn't noticed before, 84 pages. What the, what the hell were we thinking about? And not only is it 84 pages, but was published <laughs> in the shortened version. <laughs> what was in the longer version? I have no idea. But, you know, it's like um, Samuel Johnson said about Paradise Lost. No one ever wished it longer. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a standard slide that just about everyone shows, and everyone says that 95% of the mass energy of the universe is mysterious, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, however, maybe that's not the entire story because the chemical elements, uh, this shows you know, chemical elements, it shows why chemistry is not important, not insignificant in our universe, only 0.025% of the mass energy. Chemical elements depend upon the baryon asymmetry, stars depend upon the baryon asymmetry, and hydrogen and helium gas, the existence of hydrogen and helium gas depends upon the baryon asymmetry. So perhaps it's more reasonable to say that 99.825% of the mass energy of the universe is mysterious. So. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. So the baryon asymmetry, we have very good measurement from CMB and from Big Bang nucleosynthesis of the baryon to entropy ratio today in the universe. And, you know, it's known to about three significant figures and it's about 10 to the minus 10. Why is there an asymmetry between matter and antimatter? It's a good thing there is or else we wouldn't be here. Uh, so it used to be thought that it was initial conditions, and this would require a causal initial conditions. Other people talk about the, the A word principle, and it's an illustration that people without ideas can still have a principle. <laughs> uh, inflation, which seemingly evades a causal issues for the density perturbations, dilutes pre-inflation baryon asymmetry by an exponential amount. So 
saying it's just initial conditions, I don't think is a plausible explanation. The modern perspective is that reheating after inflation produced a symmetric universe where there's equal abundances of matter and antimatter and the asymmetry developed dynamically after inflation and reheating through a process known as baryogenesis. I first uh, was people referred to this and I referred to this as originally as baryosynthesis, like nucleosynthesis. And uh, actually Wolfram convinced me it's not a synthesis, it's a genesis. So it, we called it baryogenesis. So why is there an asymmetry at all? And why is it about 10 to the minus 10? Can the standard model of particle physics explain a tiny number uh, no, or at least not yet. There are explanations, but it's not clear which one is correct. And uh, there's a number that's not so tiny. The um, order of unity number in the ratio of the density today of dark matter to baryons of 5.3. It's sort of an order one number, and that might be easier to explain. So the idea of starting after inflation, reheating, defrosting the universe from the low entropy state of inflation uh, with a symmetric universe, how must the standard model be augmented to produce an asymmetric universe? So there are many, many models for baryogenesis. And uh, you know, I just did a, a Google search for the word baryogenesis and came up with primordial cosmic strength, magnetic fields, black holes, dissipative, warm cloister. I don't know, I have any idea what that is, cold, Planck, et cetera. You know, there are about 35 different ideas for baryogenesis. Uh, I won't discuss all of them. I'll discuss my three favorite, gut baryogenesis, electroweak baryogenesis, and thermal leptogenesis. And I have some backup slides that I don't think I'll get to. I, I, don't, I don't really want to get to them. Catholic dying baryogenesis and spontaneous baryogenesis. I think the ones on the left hand side, um, to me, to my eye, to my mind, are, are more appropriate. All right, so everyone has to start with the Sakharov criteria in the standard model. How can you generate a baryon asymmetry? Well, the first thing is sort of obvious you have to have baryon number violating processes. Well, in the standard model, there are baryon number violating processes, and it's non perturbative. Um, thank you, Tuft. But the uh, rate is very, very small at zero temperature. But Klinkhammer and Manton and others in the uh, 70s show that, in fact, at high temperature, there are baryon number uh, violating reactions that uh, need not be small. And which will be important for electroweak baryogenesis, they are much different rate in the broken phase or in the symmetric phase um, associated with the electroweak phase transition. So uh, keep this in mind because when I talk about electroweak baryogenesis, it will be important. Obviously, we have to have C and CP violating processes of baryon number dot under C and CP. And uh, there is standard model direct CP violation, but it's a small number. Um, so it will turn out that this will be really too small to be useful. The standard model CP violation is too small to be useful. Um, it was pointed out by Demopoulos and Suskin, had a, just a simple, well, Sakharov knew it, that you have to have non-equilibrium conditions. And, um, this is if CPT is conserved, you have to have non-equilibrium conditions. And in the standard model, at least of standard cosmology, it's always very close to equilibrium conditions. So somehow we have to have departures from equilibrium to generate a baryon asymmetry. All right, here's a little history. <coughs> there was an explosion of interest in the late 70s. Uh, and I think it was largely uh, driven by the Georgie Glashow 1974 SU5 paper. And I see probably four of us in the, in the room remember 1974. Um, and uh, shortly, well, four years after that, there was that, an interest. That was the summer that Nixon resigned. Sorry? That was the summer that Nixon resigned. Ah, okay. 
Who remembers Nixon? <laughs> <laughs> remember Nixon? <laughs> yeah. And I think um, Saturday Night Fever came out that year or something like that. Uh, so Yoshimura, uh, within the context of SU5, tried to say, aha, baryon number violation in SU5, that can explain the baryon asymmetry. But he didn't, uh, he used only two, two to two scattering processes and uh, didn't have a departure from equilibrium. So this problem was realized, a uh, paper by Toussaint, Treeman, Wilczek, and C, and also by Steve Barr pointed out the problem. And Demopoulos and Suskin were the first people to use out of, out of equilibrium decay scenario. And Weinberg and later Yoshimura uh, made quantitative calculations based upon the out of equilibrium decays. Then uh, shortly after that, full boy, Boltzmann toy model reaction network, like the nucleosynthesis network I talked about, toy models, including in decays, inverse decays, and two to two processes, uh, was written by uh, Stephen and I at Caltech, and also here at Chicago by Fry, Olive, and Turner. And then uh, applications to SU5 and SO10 using what we learned from these toy model processes uh, was this paper that I did with Jeff and David Reese and Stephen. And I thought this was in the spirit of Wagner, Fowler, and Hoyle. So uh, I don't remember exactly, well, uh, let me keep that for a minute. So grand unified theories are beyond the standard model, but embrace the fundamental underpinnings of the standard model, spontaneously broken gauge theories, fundamental quarks and leptons, et cetera. So it's not, uh, terribly far beyond the standard model. Uh, so gut, let me first talk about gut baryogenesis. There's a theoretical motivation to unify strong with electroweak interactions. And one expects the unification at a mass scale 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 16 GeV. And uh, this is something that um, Pierre Ramon talked about in SU5, the gauge bosons are in the 24, et cetera. And there's a coupling of fermions to gauge and Higgs bosons. So the model, at least the simplest SU5 model, is pretty simple. So uh, baryon number can be violated in the decays of supermassive gauge bosons. And the decay rate is something like alpha times the mass over three. Higgs boson decay rate is probably smaller because the Higgs uh, coupling, the Yukawa coupling is smaller. And then uh, you have to get CP violation from the interference of tree and loop diagrams. And in SU5, it's the best you can do is find something like 10 to the minus 5. It's smallish, but it's something you can work with. And the large mass enables out of equilibrium decays. So um, this is uh, the paper that Stephen and I wrote in, uh, published in 1980. And uh, it was, again, a 60 page, I never write 60 page papers anymore. And uh, we had this toy model and we thought that, uh, gee, it'd be nice to apply this to what we call realistic grand unified theories. Although how realistic they are was a little bit of a matter of debate. So I don't know how we ended up working with Jeff and David, uh, so the only information I have about that was given to me by Wolfram. So you can, but that, that's my source. You can believe it or not. <laughs> and he said, he went to, uh, he said, well, I, I knew, I know somebody who knows something about grand unified theories, Pierre Ramon. So Stephen went to Pierre and said, Hey, do, do you know, want to work on this problem with this? And Pierre said, not on your life, <laughs> but I have two students and I don't want to do anything with them anymore. You know, so keep my students busy, go work with Jeff and uh, David. And it was really, um, and it just led to this paper. It really was, uh, I thought a wonderful time that we worked together and it was people of different character, different personalities. <laughs> there was occasionally a little bit of tension in the collaboration, but uh, you know, it all worked out. 
and it ended up uh, with this paper. It just required enough ice cream and Cadbury chocolate bars. <laughs> right, right. So um, Stephen uh, had in the refrigerator and fourth floor of Lawrenceon huge stashes of ice cream and chocolate bars. <laughs> And he decided he was gaining weight, so he would go on an exercise regimen. And the exercise consisted of running down the hall to the refrigerator <laughs> to get an ice cream before he went back. <laughs> okay, so the, I, I looked at this paper for the first time in a long time, and um, here's a figure. <laughs> Stephen loved these things. <laughs> QR, that was the first QR code I ever used. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember he was playing around with uh, computer algebra, and I said, Stephen, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. <laughs> Okay, so just uh, to show you some equations and let you know why we stopped doing this. <laughs> this is uh, the reaction network in SU5, um, involving X bosons, scalar bosons, baryon number, neutrino number, I don't know, a pi, the fiveness number and things like that. So there's about eight or so uh, reactions in the network. And uh, we spent a long time calculating the interaction rates, the decay rates, the inverse decay rates, and things like that. And it was, it was actually a lot of fun. And I, I learned a lot, um, especially from Jeff. So then we went on to SO10, and things sort of blew up. And the next step we were going to do was to go to E6. <laughs> but you know, looking at SU5 to SO10, it was becoming exponentially more complicated, more particles, more reaction rates, things like that. Uh, so if actually I do have some notes in my office scribbling some initial things for E6, but I think Jeff decided he had better things to do and uh, but we never did do E6. What a shame. Okay, gut baryogenesis, the problems with gut bary baryogenesis, the biggest problem was experimental, the proton seems stubbornly stable. Now, uh, Pierre in the first talk said the proton can decay any minute now, or something like that, you know, in some time in his lifetime. Good luck. And uh, let's see, there was a cosmo some cosmological issues. B minus L is the conserved global quantum number in SU5, so you only produce B plus L asymmetry, which is washed out by sphalerons later. Uh, the symmetry breaking of SU5 overproduces magnetic monopoles in the phase transition by the Hibble, Hibble mechanism and thermal production. And uh, the expected reheat temperatures after inflation generally are smaller than, than the unification scale. So there are cosmological issues in addition to experimental issues uh, having gut baryogenesis. Now, perhaps there's unification at a larger mass scale, and this would also help with the out of equilibrium conditions. And beyond SU5, SO10 has spontaneously broken local B minus L, so you can produce a B minus L asymmetry along with the B plus L that will survive phalerons. The cosmological issues are still pro problematic. There are ways to dance around them, uh, but it's still an issue. Uh, nevertheless, if proton decay is seen at hyper, super, extra special Kamiokande in the next uh, year, as Pierre has, Pierre has predicted, uh, maybe we'll take an, another look at this, and maybe we'll do E6. Okay, so that was gut baryogenesis. Now let me say, uh, talk about another possibility for baryogenesis, and that is electroweak baryogenesis. It's a very beautiful, another very beautiful idea that doesn't seem to work in its simplest in, um, implementation. So the idea of electrobaryogenesis is that the baryon asymmetry is generated at the electroweak phase transition from the seed of CP violating interactions of particles scattering at the Higgs field bubble wall. 
So uh, one assumes there's a first order electroweak phase transition. You nucleate a broken phase in the symmetric phase background, and the broken phase expands into the unbroken phase. Now, in the broken phase, phaleron um, reactions are suppressed, while in the symmetric phase, phalerons are unsuppressed. Um, so there's, a, in the first start of phase transition, the fact that there's a phase coexistence uh, gives you the non-equilibrium condition. So that's one thing that uh, you have. And if there is CP violation, well, there is CP violation in Higgs fermion interactions, different transmission and reflection of left and right-handed quarks at the wall lead to a CP asymmetry at the wall. So you start off with the uh, uh, broken phase and the symmetric phase. This is the Higgs field. Then you end up with the CP asymmetry across the wall as the wall is expanding uh, into the symmetric phase. Then spalerons violate baryon number and they interact with the left-handed quarks, not the right-handed quarks. So the CP asymmetry is converted to a baryon asymmetry in front of the wall. Then the baryon asymmetry diffuses into the broken phase and then you generate a baryon asymmetry. Except there are problems. First problem is that the phase transition in the standard model is not first order. The Higgs mass is too large, and I think you need a Higgs mass of something on the order of less than 72 GeV for a first order electroweak phase transition. So the Higgs mass is too large, the CP violation is too small in the standard model. Um, you know, the, there are limits, the Yarlskog invariant is small, um, neutron, nuclei, electric dipole moments, etc. Also, the, in the detailed calculations, the wall velocity may be too large, and as the velocity of the wall goes to one, the wall moves too fast for the baryon asymmetry to diffuse into the broken phase bubbles. So the bad news is that electroweak baryogenesis doesn't work within the standard model, but the good news, it may point to directions beyond the standard model. How far beyond the standard model to have the electroweak phase transition be first order? That's the first thing you have to do. Well, um, people are probably too young to remember the minimal supersymmetric standard model. It was promising if there's a light right-handed stop, and some of my colleagues here worked on that, Marcella and, and uh, Carlos, et cetera. Uh, but increasingly stringent LHC constraints challenge challenge being a kind word, uh, rule out is more appropriate, uh, this idea. Uh, the next non-minimal, next minimal supersymmetric standard model is more promising. You add an extra gauge singlet, um, strengthens the phase transition. Again, people have worked on that. Two Higgs models, a uh, little bit hard to make work since the models that might work have very large Higgs cell couplings. Uh, the most promising and simplest, just looking at the literature, this is my opinion, is to add a singlet scalar um, coupled to the Higgs uh, and make, uh, provide a cubic term in the potential. So there are ways to make the electroweak phase transition first order beyond the standard model. And there's a lot of work probing models for first order phase transitions at LHC and future colliders. And also interesting is that first order phase transition can lead to gravitational waves. And uh, Leanne Tao and, and Andrew Long and people have worked uh, quite a bit on trying to predict what they would be. So you have to do a little work to have uh, the phase transition first order in electroweak baryogenesis. You also have to go beyond the standard model to have CP violations sufficiently large. Uh, the CP phase in the MSSM Chargino mass matrix lead to chiral Chargino asymmetry, leads to a chiral quark asymmetry, and again, Marcella and Carlos and collaborators have worked on that. Uh, but again, there are constraints that really pin this down. Uh, so there are ways to add extra CP violation, but they're really pushing up against uh, limits both laboratory experiments, both from the LHC 
and from EDM constraints, etc. So it's sort of interesting, the electroweak baryogenesis doesn't work in the standard model, but the ingredients are in place. You need another source of CP violation, invading, flavor changing, neutral currents, dipole moments, etc. And to have the phase transition first orders in all, just about all these models, you have to couple a lightish fields to the Higgs. This induces non-standard model tri-Higgs couplings, HZZ couplings, et cetera, that can be probed at colliders. And a sufficiently strong first order transition could be produced, could produce gravitational waves detectable by ELISA. Uh, people have heard of LISA, the proposed gravitational wave satellite experiment. ELISA is extensive LISA. <laughs> so and also aspects of the calculation is difficult. Wall velocity, transport, equations across the wall, gravitational wave production. These are all really tough uh, calculational problems. And uh, in comparison, I think the work we did on on um, gut baryogenesis is sort of linear and straightforward. Okay, so uh, the last possibility I want to talk about is thermal leptogenesis. And I think this is a simple, elegant, compelling explanation for a complex physical phenomenon. And uh, it was it's often said that for every complex physical phenomenon, there's a, there is a simple, elegant, compelling, wrong explanation. <laughs> I don't know whether this is right, but I, to me, it's the most attractive explanation now. So uh, this starts with the type one seesaw model for neutrino masses and mixing, which enlarges the standard model to include a Majorana neutrino with a large mass, which couples to standard model leptons and Higgs via you know, some Yukawa coupling. Of course, it's a, it's a matrix uh, mixing. Uh, a large Majorana mass for, the, for N, small Dirac mass for nu, <clears throat> generated by electroweak Higgs mechanism, and the seesaw magically results in a light neutrino mass on the order of about 0.3 electron volts, depending upon lambda and the mass of the N. So you want the mass of the N to be rather large, around 10 to the 12 GeV, which will help with the outer equilibrium conditions. In, <coughs> in this model, the uh, N decays the standard model leptons and Higgs, violating lepton number by plus or minus one unit. The N decays to lepton and Higgs are um, anti-lepton and Higgs. So we're going to assume that there's CP violation. I'll have a word, say a word about that later, and that the decay rate of N to anti-leptons is greater than the decay rate of N to leptons. And if there's none, if there is none equilibrium conditions can generate a lepton asymmetry through the decay of the N, uh, and it has B minus L not equal to zero. And sphalerons will destroy B plus L at temperatures larger than about 100 GeV, but conserve B minus L. So if you start with initial conditions of lepton number not equal to zero and baryon number equal to zero, you end up roughly with the final baryon number of the left minus the initial lepton number over two. And uh, the actual calculation was done by Jeff and Mike Turner. And, uh, is minus 28 over 79, at least in uh, the simplest models. I can't believe everything you see in textbooks. <laughs> okay, so that, that looks promising. What about CP violation? This requires interference between the tree amplitude in uh, the decay, and this will be the lightest uh, right-handed particle, and uh, the one-loop calculation and the lepton number is generated in decay proportional to the CP parameter. I don't know what happened. That should be an epsilon. And uh, well, this is what it is. And you can express the CP violation in terms of microphysics. And it's uh, related to the mass of uh, the lightest heavy one and the, light, and the heaviest light one. And um, 
If completely out of equilibrium, only drift and decay, then the baryon number ends up being sufficiently large, 10 to the minus 2 times uh, epsilon 1. Uh, you have to worry about non-equilibrium conditions, so the end decay products thermalized, if the temperature is large enough, can wash out lepton number through processes like uh, inverse decay, two to two processes that violate lepton number by plus or minus one, or two to two processes that violate lepton number by plus or minus two. So inverse decay, two to two scattering processes can wash out the baryon asymmetry produced in simply in the decay. And the efficiency of washout depends upon the competition between reaction rates, which are a function of model parameters and the temperature, and the expansion rate of the universe, depending upon the temperature. And these are just some rates. There's inverse decay. Everything's proportional to the decay rate. But inverse decay, uh, two to two processes violating the lepton number by one unit, and two to two processes violating the lepton number by two units. And the decay rate, I might have this on the previous slide, uh, is not directly related to any light mass or anything, but it's related to some, some mass uh, defined by this. And it is between the lightest neutrino mass and the most massive uh, light neutrino. So this leads to interesting constraints on the neutrino sector parameters. The condition for uh, decay uh, being out of equilibrium is that M1 tilde is less than about 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. And again, M1 tilde is larger than the lightest light neutrino and the most massive light neutrino. Uh, the bound on RMS neutrino masses to avoid uh, lepton number and delta L equal 2 washout is that the RMS of the neutrino masses has to be smaller than 0.3 electron volts. So this, these come up with interesting numbers uh, for the neutrino sector. Um, lepton, leptogenesis beyond, is beyond the standard model, but motivated by observation of neutrino oscillations and masses. Also, the mass of right-handed N present in guts beyond SU5, for instance, SO10. This scenario has all the necessary ingredients lepton number violation from N decay, followed by B violation from Spaleron conversion to a baryon asymmetry. CP violation from complex Yukawa couplings, out of, out of equilibrium decay for reasonable model parameters. Experimental proof of the Majorana nature of neutrinos would give a boost to this scenario. And this, again, is the inner space, outer space connection between the baryon asymmetry, one number, and the richness of type one seesaw models. So let me back up a minute and let's see, I think I said something about CP, oh, CP violation. Now, unfortunately, we won't be able to get all of the parameters necessary for CP violation from low energy experiments because in, you know, there's uh, many more CP phases in the complete theory, in the high energy theory, than can be probed in the low energy theory. So we can't get all of the information from uh, Dune. Sorry, Ed. Okay, I guess I just said this. But if, if Dune finds very small CP violation, is it possible you could still have large enough CP violations? Yeah, I think so. Because, Be because there, there are other phases. So you could have some cancellations between large CP violating effects and the actual neutrino mass matrix that comes out. But the, the light sector does not, you cannot probe all of the, C, all of the yeah. phases, CP violating phases, just in the light sector. Mm -hmm. So you can have large ones in the heavy sector that you've integrated out. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I mean, the best. Probably the easiest way to see the Majorana nature is neutrino is double beta decay. Yes. Yeah. But you need the electron electron mass to be pretty big to have a chance of seeing it soon. If it's the, yes. the normal hierarchy, it seems like your M1 was pretty small. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, but you know, the, this, this is the simplest 
yeah. seesaw model, and uh, you know any competent theoretical physicist can dance around any finite number of experimental sure. constraints. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me give uh, some conclusions. The standard model of particle physics alone, combined with the standard cosmological model, cannot explain the barrier and asymmetry, at least so far. And perhaps cosmology is pointing some giving some points to directions beyond the standard model. Electroweak baryogenesis, you need a first order phase transition. New scalars coupled to Higgs, for instance, new sources of CP violation. Thermal leptogenesis exploits uh, BSM physics in, in the neutrino sector. And gut baryogenesis uses the concept of unification of forces. Uh, perhaps the answer will come from completely non-standard cosmology or from physics well, well or way beyond the standard model. Uh, you know, perhaps we need a disruption in high energy physics or astro. So what high, high energy physics disruptions can we hope for? Well, great new theoretical ideas in cosmology or particle physics are welcome. Unexpected discoveries in particle physics or cosmology are welcome. Observation of proton decay, evidence of perturbative barrier number violation at gut scales, then we would probably re-examine gut baryogenesis. Discovery of low-ish scale SUSY, good luck, would open new possibilities for electroweak baryogenesis. Discovery of non-standard model Higgs couplings at colliders could mean electroweak transition is first order, pointing to electroweak baryogenesis. Evidence for non-minimal Higgs sector could affect the electroweak transition and introduce new CP phases. Observation of non-standard model sources of CP violation, say large neutrino EDM or some neutron EDM uh, would be uh, useful. And proof that neutrinos are Majorana particles would give impetus to thermal leptogenesis. And on the astro side, observations of a stochastic background of gravitational radiation with ELISA could be evidence for first order phase transitions uh, as uh, needed for electroweak baryogenesis. Observation of a baryon isocurvature component might suggest a rolling field as in afflictine or spontaneous baryogenesis, which I didn't talk about. And observation of primordial magnetic fields may point to a role in baryogenesis. Uh, so thanks to my collaborators over the years working on baryogenesis, Jeff Harvey is here, Michael Turner is here, Stephen Wolfram, I uh, worked with uh, many people and for the most part enjoyed it. <laughs> I benefited from reading reviews by Tony, Jim Klein, Luke Muller, et cetera. That there's been reviews written that uh, really brought me up to date. And I benefited from conversations and communications with Andrew Long and Jim Klein. So happy birthday, Jeff. I think I'm finishing at noon, as I'm supposed to. It's really wonderful working with you. And uh, when Barrier number by when uh, proton is seen to decay, we'll tackle E6, all right? All right. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Questions, Jeff? So you explained that it's going to be hard to really test leptogenesis through low energy experiments. Is there any conceivable way of getting more information about it from cosmology? large lepton numbers at some part of the evolution of the universe or something else where well, that, that would be a disruptive um, discovery in uh, cosmology if the baryon if the lepton number or baryon number is not uh, uniform you know if there are regions where there's large baryon numbers or lepton numbers in fact I've had some stupid models with I, I, I won't mention who I had these models. It wasn't with you, but uh, that, that tried to do some things like that. Is, uh, is ELISA um, sensitive enough that if there was any, can you play with the parameters enough that ELISA wouldn't be sensitive to a primordial uh, first order phase transition? Or are you sort of guaranteed to see it if it's there? I, th I think you can, but uh, Leon Tao has worked on this. I mean, maybe you want to say something? 
Well, it depends. First of all, it depends on when the phase transition happens. Well, this would be the electroweak weak phase transition. Yeah, electro weak uh, also, you know, there is a, the, the, the amplitude is determined by the, the, the latent heat being released. So it really still depends on the detail of the, of the potential. So it could be within the EDs range, but it could also be not. So it's, I think uh, if there's a positive detection, there is a good uh, good evidence that something is happening around the electro weak scale. But if it's, it's not, uh, I don't, I'm not sure you can complete it with that. Not like most things. So. John? It may be time to take another look at E6 because the, it uh, generates uh, extra neutrinos. Sterile uh, neutrinos. Did Which we really so start on E6? I find that hard to believe. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have notes. Um, Maybe that was in the we, we have to bring David Reese out of retirement. And uh, I don't think we can study this using cellular automata. So I, I, I don't know what we can do. Why, why E6? Why, why particularly E6? It's the only one with complex representations. That's the reason? Well. Because Jeff was working on E6. <laughs> there's, a, there's a natural embedding, you know, from SU3 times SU2 to SU5 to SO10 to E6 to E7 to E8. Okay. So if All you right. like this chain and you like exceptional things, then E6 <laughs> is the next thing to do, look at. Yeah, but if you don't go to E7 and E8 for the reason I said. Right? <laughs> what, what? You don't go to E7 and E8 because they no longer have complex representations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So if there are no other questions, let me turn it over to an organizer to wish us uh, happy travels back. Thank you. Thank you. On, on behalf of my uh, uh, co-conspirators, I'd like to thank you all for coming to help us uh, celebrate uh, Jeff's uh, 66 plus or minus one. <laughs> and, um, and indeed, um, uh, thanks for all of you for making this such a, a success uh, and wishing uh, Jeff all the best and uh, safe travels to wherever you're going. So uh, thank you all. And I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on such a uh, <laughs>